Great, so the next speaker will be Mohamed Suhail Rehman, who will present um, his approach and tool, uh, Fuzzy Data, which is a scalable workload generator for testing data frame workflow systems. So uh, very much looking forward to your talk. Mm -hmm. Hi, just give me a second. I'm just making sure I share the yep. screen from my side. And I want to make sure. Uh, yeah, okay. And let's see. Um, do I have? Oh, wow. Okay. I mean, I, yeah, I'm having trouble moving the. Oh, okay. Let's see. All right. I guess we'll work with this. Okay. Uh, so, hi, uh, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Suhail. I'm from, uh, also from the University of Chicago. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I'll be talking about fuzzy data, which is a scalable workload generator for testing data frame workflow systems. I just want to quickly verify that the remote uh, participants can see both see my slides and they can hear me. Right? Okay, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Let's go. So let's quickly talk about database benchmarking because this is DB test after all, uh, testing and benchmarking. So for relational database systems such as uh, uh, you know, any sort of like SQL based system, there's been a long and rich history of benchmarking tools. Uh, it has gotten a little political as well, especially after uh, the uh, Wisconsin benchmark and the resulting sort of uh, tussle between academia and industry, but things got resolved with uh, uh, some, to some degree with the TPC benchmarks after that. But they are great tools for, you know, doing apples to apples comparisons between different sort of relational systems. Um, Things changed in the world since then, and uh, a lot of uh, data management systems were, uh, you know, to, built to serve large uh, web-based applications that need to scale extremely, uh, uh, you know, both geographically distributed as well as number of users. So key value stores became very popular for uh, serving uh, sort of these web-based workloads. So YCSB emerged as a very strong uh, database benchmarking system again to do apples to apples comparisons between different sort of key value store systems like you know memcached and things like that um so what i'm trying to convince you guys is um, data frame systems are pretty popular uh, especially for folks doing sort of machine learning work or data analysis they're quite popular inside you know sort of computational notebook environments uh, and uh, there really isn't a good benchmark for the sort of these systems that do uh, manipulate data frames. Uh, and I, hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll try to convince you why one should exist and why you might consider using what I built as a, as a stepping stone to create this, these kinds of benchmarks. So what makes data frames different from both key value stores and relational databases? Well, the thing about data frames is that they allow for a mix of linear algebra operations, uh, uh, relational operations, as well as some sort of spreadsheet style operations. Uh, you know, with linear algebra, these are the typical sort of machine learning style operations, uh, operations like normalization, stuff that you do across uh, the entire matrix or column by column. Uh, relational, of course, all of your select project join, all of your relational operators are supported in data frames. Spreadsheet operations are interesting. You can do sort of cleaning operations. You can do value replacements. You can find all the null values in your data frame and replace them with something else. So you can also do these kinds of like interesting spreadsheet operations on data frames. So Data frames are actually quite old, even though they're pretty new in the sort of this Python pandas environment. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if the text is too small for the folks in the room, but the idea was, you know, they came from a statistical uh, background. They came from the S programming language back in 1976, got open source in 1993 through R, and then Wes McKinney in 2008 uh, liked the statistical sort of uh, uh, API that R had, but wanted to apply Python operators and you know work on NumPy um, arrays. Uh, so he invented pandas, and pandas uh, blew up in popularity since then. And then they've been applied to all sorts of scientific and machine learning workloads. It's uh, become so big now that this data frame ecosystem is uh, is huge and continuously expanding. And the main reason for this is that pandas was uh, written with in-memory data frames in mind, and you know uh, doesn't necessarily use the best memory layouts. So a ton of projects have come out trying to improve the data frame API by extending it, by uh, making uh, using better memory models, by introducing sort of parallel and distributed computation and doing usability improvements and things like that. Or, you know, try to offload some of the data frame computation to GPUs. And, uh, uh, but again, 
Um, the issue now is, uh, so we have all of these competing systems. They somewhat use similar APIs. At least people are thinking in terms of data frames. How do you do performance evaluation for these data frame systems? Uh, and currently what we have is mostly anecdotal performance reports. So when you either read papers that uh, talk about these new systems like Modin or uh, uh, if you visit websites uh, you know, for Polars, that is data frames on Rust, uh, typically there'll be like an advertising pitch and they'll tell you, you know, use our system, your uh, data frame operations will scale by X factor where X is you know, the number of cores that you have, for example. So, um, you know, this is uh, a screenshot from Modin's page. So they kind of talk about here are three typical operations that you do on uh, uh, pandas, like read CSV uh, is a column null or apply a, uh, apply a function across an entire column or an entire row, uh, like an apply map. And then they say that they're between two to five times faster. Uh, however, uh, if you also go to the GitHub issues page for Modin and many of these projects, you'll see a lot of uh, users coming back with performance regressions. And this is typical for databases, right? People will say, okay, there are these performance problems and um, you know, this other operation that I'm doing, I expected it to be fast, but no, this is actually slower than pandas. And um, you know, uh, users may be asking, okay, like how do we fix this? Or even the modern team and the users wanna work collaboratively to fix some of these performance problems. It's not a knock on modern, it's just that this is a new project. And of course this, these things take time as, uh, especially uh, with, uh, you know, it's, it's all over the database field, right? Like the, you, 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 it's, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> so the other issue with uh, current benchmarks and why they can't be used with data frames is that they have sort of this limited coverage. So um, the one, if you Google uh, data frame benchmark right now, your top hit is going to be something called the database-like operations benchmark. And this is from h2o.ai. So what they do is they, uh, they basically have a, a leaderboard of the top data frame engines and how fast they are on certain queries. And when I say by certain queries, they literally have three queries. There's a group by query, there's a joint query, and there's another group by query. And they have three scale factors between uh, half a gig to 50 gigs. So it's not bad. But again, it doesn't touch uh, anywhere close to the wide variety of operations that you could be doing on data frames. So you, we need sort of a robust reproducible workload generation system that's tailored for the data frame API. Uh, and let's think about what some of those workload generation requirements would be for such a system. Uh, the first thing I would argue is that data frames are used on an extremely wide variety of data so you want your data frames themselves, the tables to have a wide variety of sort of data types and, uh, 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 and values. And in this talk, I'm going to use the term data frame and artifact almost interchangeably. So any, any sort of table that you wanna keep on disk, I would sort of refer to that as an artifact. So you wanna allow for different data types. You wanna allow for arbitrarily large strings because this is the kind of real data that people process with data frames. They're not all going to be integers. The next thing is I, you would want to also develop workflows that have different structures. Some may be linear, but some may be star-like. And you want to try to mimic da different data analysis patterns. So some people may work on a data frame, they will apply an operation and they'll keep going in a linear fashion because they have a straightforward workflow. But not all workflows are like this. If you are doing uh, sort of some kind of machine learning workflow, workflow, then you might split your data frame into test and train sets and you might do that in different branches. So that would be a branching workflow. If you're doing a purely data analysis workflow, you're starting with a data frame and then you're looking at different views of that data frame. So that's gonna be like a star-like uh, workflow. So what I have created with the uh, fuzzy data is uh, a way for which of, uh, in which we can express what these typical data frame workflows look like, but in an abstract manner so that we can sort of encode that abstraction and then replay them on different data frame style systems, even if there are changes in the APIs between these data frame systems. So let's say we have these tables, they could be parquet files, they could be CSV files, and you're, uh, you know, you're part of your uh, data analysis workflows that you're merging them together and to create a, a single wide table. So you have a merge operation. And then let's say you did some kind of filter and then you did a pivot operation. Now that's one of those spreadsheet style operations that uh, 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 is pretty natural and native to data frames, but not necessarily uh, something that people do in uh, relational systems. 
So this is what we want to sort of encapsulate in a single abstraction. We want to take this and we want to be able to run it on multiple different systems. This gives us a way of testing them and also comparing the performance between them. So my primary abstractions are, I have an abstraction for a data artifact. It's a representation of a table. What are the types of columns that it has? What are the column labels? Uh, basically some uh, representation of the schema as well as how do you serialize this artifact and how do, uh, and by serialize, I mean, how do you write this to disk or some persistent format and how do you get back, get it back into memory? Um, I have an abstraction for operations. So here it's just a sort of a semantic specification of what an operation does. What are the typical arguments for that operation? And also, and it allows us to encode what is the typical expected change of schema when you apply that operation. That's the other abstraction that I have. And finally, I have a workflow abstraction. So a workflow is nothing but a list of artifacts, especially the source artifacts. Source artifacts are artifacts that were not generated by an existing operation in the workflow, as well as a list of operations that transform the artifacts to another artifacts. If you retain all of this information in a, in a client agnostic manner, well, you can write clients and you can replay this workflow across different clients. And that's the main sort of five minute pitch of what uh, fuzzy data is supposed to be. So if now that you have all of these abstractions, now that you have all of this data encoded about the workflow, you can now basically write client wrappers that just take that abstract workflow specification and run it across different systems. So using the same uh, uh, abstraction, I can just uh, basically create a pandas workflow. I can create a Modin workflow. For those of you who are aware uh, about Modin, it's actually not that difficult. You just change sort of what the your pandas import was. But more importantly, you can also even do a SQL translation uh, and uh, generate SQL code as well. And I'll show you very quickly what that looks like. But first, I also want to talk about the random artifact generator. And this goes back to the first keynote we heard today uh, about fuzzing. Um, the Faker library in Python is an excellent way for uh, folks to basically generate ex just completely random data frames with realistic data types. So I've used that library. I have the entire repertoire of all the different types of data artifacts, I mean, data values that I can generate. This is a real example of a data frame that I was generated using my random artifact generator. So you can have random dates. You can have, uh, you know, one of the columns is called cryptocurrency code. So it'll actually generate realistic values for each of these columns. Um, and then I have two random integer uh, columns as well. So uh, the main thing that I have is uh, I can uh, generate these different types and then I've got a taxonomy of these uh, columns. It's uh, uh, details of this are in, uh, are in the paper of how I decide some of these columns, but generally I group each of the types of columns that I can generate into uh, a groupable column if it has lower cardinality, so it, it can be naturally used for group by operations. Uh, joinable if it uh, has slightly higher cardinality, but then allows you, you can create another sort of side table that you can join with this table. And then numeric and string columns, and this allows us to generate randomized workflows. Uh, operations, again, the operation abstraction is just uh, like I mentioned, you, you want to encode the operational semantics and you want to talk about the expected change in schema that happens between uh, the, the source artifact and the uh, destination artifact. So, and as, as well as its arguments. So for example, if you did a group by on one of the CSV files here, uh, you will only end up with a projection of the columns that is a result of the group by, right? Like there'll be some columns that you group by on, some columns that you may apply some aggregate function on, uh, but typically the, the, the width of the uh, data frame will shorten and then we, we can encode that in the, operation abstraction as well. Uh, but the actual implementation and code generation is actually left to the client. So we're just encoding just the semantics of the operation. We don't talk about exactly what is the code or what is the SQL, what is a template, SQL query template that's used to generate these. And finally for workflows, uh, like I said, they're just source artifacts that uh, have a list of operations to generate new artifacts. Um, fuzzy data allows you to either specify this workflow manually. So you can write a JSON specific specification of here are some uh, source data frames and here are the operations that I want to perform on them. Or you can use our randomized workflow generator and it'll actually generate this uh, uh, at random, both using random artifacts as well as random operations to generate a random graph. So it's, it's like the ultimate in fuzzing in some sense. Um, 
in future, we want to look at how we can auto generate this JSON specification by just looking at a notebook. It shouldn't be necessarily too difficult, but we can look at that as well. So if you want to generate a completely random workflow, we're using random artifacts as well as operations. There's uh, parameters that you can supply to fuzzy data. You can tell that I would like to generate 100 data frames, for example. And uh, the, the source data frames need to have a certain number of rows or columns. And then I have a branching factor, which allows us to sort of manipulate the structure of the, the final graph that gets generated. Uh, if you want to say, I want to generate all possible transformations, you can do that. Or you can say, exclude pivots, for example, because it's not easy to do a pivot in SQL, for example, in a templated manner. Uh, and then materialization, right? Like how many operations do you want to do before you write out a data frame? So how many, how, many, uh, how many nested SQL queries you want to do before materializing a view in the SQL world? And data frames is how many chained operations you would like to do on a data frame before writing it out. So that's the materialization rate. Um, the branch factor is actually, uh, there's a little bit of math involved in it, but basically it's the, uh, I compute, uh, given that I have already uh, generated I data frames or I artifacts so far, it's how we select the next, the probability of selecting the next artifact that I want to manipulate. Uh, and it's uh, basically uh, like a sort of like an exponential function that you can control. So if you want a linear artifact, you can just set D equals 001. But if you want to get something that's more branched, you can set it to different values. If you want stars, uh, star-like, you can actually go into the negative value and then you can get a, so this is just a graph manipulate, a way that you can manipulate the graph generation in runtime to have these different uh, structures. So uh, right now we have three client implementations, uh, Pandas, Modin, and SQLite. So given an abstract workflow specification that says data frame one, and I want to sample 100 rows from data frame one, the Pandas code is actually pretty simple. It's just df1.sample uh, n equals 100. And this is generated by the Pandas client for fuzzy data. The Modin client is exactly the same, except that it will change the Pandas import for to uh, uh, it uses the modern library to generate this. Then that's a very simple client implementation. However, you know something more complicated would be like how do you express this in SQL? So we have SQL templates for each of these in the SQL light client implementation. And then I in SQL I'm just you, the source artifacts are actual tables, but then the corresponding sort of new artifacts that I generate are just views. You could also change that to to materialize as tables as well immediately. But it, we just use nested expressions to, to say, okay. And then when we materialize that, that's finally like a, a view that we can use. So all of this code generation happens automatically from fuzzy data from the abstract specification of, uh, there is, uh, I wouldn't go into too much detail about uh, what uh, what is the matrix of all possible transformations that you can do. But uh, basically we, we the coverage is quite good. We've got select project apply, join, sample. We've got uh, pivot that is supported by the data frame uh, systems, but not uh, in SQLite, but you know, somebody can ob obviously, if they find a neat way to write a SQL template uh, for SQLite, you can do that. The fill operator is also not support, not currently supported in SQLite, but you can think of a, a way in which we can uh, do that as well. Um, more details in the paper, obviously. So let's quickly go through the use cases. So the first thing is, uh, how do you use this for like a performance and correctness analysis uh, sort of uh, requirement? for actually looking at data frame systems. The idea is uh, now we can synthetically generate arbitrary number of workflows with arbitrary complexity and arbitrary data frames themselves, artifacts themselves. So literally uh, fuzzy data has a pretty big uh, testing suite that it generates like 60, 70 different workflows and then automatically runs it over different data frame uh, engines. So you can, you can include this in your CI pipeline if you want to. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, not at this stage, but uh, um, but I'm actually working actively with the modern folks to integrate it into their CI pipeline in a way that doesn't fail tests, but at least will surface some issues that they have. In fact, uh, uh, we found a correctness issue in modern using fuzzy data and reported it to the modern developers. So uh, uh, if you load a data frame from disk and apply two consecutive group by operations on that data frame, it works in both pandas and modern. But if you generated that data frame in memory, or if you created a, a bunch of NumPy arrays, uh, concatenated them together as a, as a data frame, and then try to apply this, this, this fails. The modern cannot execute this query. It'll actually error out. So this is a good way to find, sort of do these kinds of uh, uh, regression tests and find out, uh, find some issues in your uh, systems. Um, the other uh, sort of use case, and this is uh, inspired by YCSB, 
is uh, the encoding and replay of workflows on different systems. So you can have one workflow and you can actually literally run it on different systems and then you can verify both in terms of correctness and performance, whether the, the same workflow executes correctly over these systems. And uh, so for example, Modin advertises their, uh, their speed up for the NYC cab based uh, workflow that they, add, uh, that they have on their main GitHub page. I took that uh, workflow, I encoded the JSON, I ran it on four different systems, uh, Pandas, Modin, and SQLite. Modin using two different backends, using the Dask uh, execution backend or using the Ray execution backend. And uh, typically what we found is that uh, whatever claims that were made in that uh, you know, introductory page on GitHub about how, how much faster Modin is, it's true. When we run it using the, the fuzzy data encoded work, workload, we are able to see the, the speed up. Uh, on Pandas, it takes 40 seconds. It uh, runs in about 14 seconds on uh, uh, Modin uh, in, on the Ray backend. And most of that performance gain is because Modin parallelizes the, the, the read CSV function very well. So it's, it reduces your data loading time quite quickly. And that's a big gain for most data frame uh, systems. Um, finally, we wanna talk about uh, workload scaling and analysis. So you can, you can take the exact same workflow with the exact same structure, and you can just increase the number of rows for all of the artifacts. The fact that I'm randomly generating these columns, that means you can add a scale factor and say, instead of hundred rows, give me a million rows. And I can literally generate more generic values for each of those columns because I'm using that system. And then you can sort of, uh, again, look at the, the scalability and you can actually see if you were getting linear scaling or if you're, if things are uh, not going as good. So here's an example of a fairly complicated workflow that was with a certain branching factor that was generated. There is a source artifact, which is in yellow, which is zero. And then I have a artifact one that it's joined with to generate two. There are three other group buys and then a bunch of sample operations. Now, you might ask me, what is this in real uh, life? I can't really explain. This is completely randomly generated, uh, right? Because it's randomly selecting data frames and randomly applying operations to them, but that's the point of fuzzing. Um, so in this example, at 1K uh, rows, uh, we are pretty okay on all, three, uh, all four systems. But as we scale to say 5 million rows, and the, it's the exact same workflow, exact same sort of artifacts, except that we've increased the number of rows. Um, Pandas outperforms uh, Modin. And uh, Fuzzy Data can also give you sort of a per operation breakdown and tell you exactly which are the operations that are taking a lot of time. And what we found is that the, the sample operation, where we say we want to sample some fraction, like say 5% of the rows, uh, those are the blue arrows in that workflow. Those were taking a lot of time on Modin. And uh, here's an opportunity to you know, come up with a good solution for Modin. Like how do you do distributed sampling? Uh, in, a, in an efficient manner that's uh, comparable to Pandas performance, for example. Um, Fuzzy Data is currently available on PIP. So you literally can PIP install it and try it for yourself. Um, a full CLI interface is available. So you can literally say, hey, uh, generate a Pandas workflow with uh, 10,000 rows uh, having 20 artifacts, which I also call versions here, and uh, about 20 columns in the, in the main source data frame. And then you can literally take that workflow and replay it on a different client. So you just say fuzzy data, take this pre-existing workflow that is in this directory and replay it on, on modem. So, and uh, you're welcome to check out the code on GitHub, uh, maybe make some contributions if you think that uh, you can write an, another client for this. Client implementations, by the way, are very simple for the system. Uh, for feature work, I'm thinking of making the, uh, random workflow generator a little more robust and try to actually uh, generate operations that humans would would uh, would write. So there's a lot of work in sort of like machine in the machine learning space for usability where they, uh, you know, uh, auto suggest looks at data frames and uh, using a pre-trained machine learning model will actually suggest what are the types of operations you should be doing on this data frame to gain insight. So you, you could sort of plug that into the generator and generate even more realistic uh, workloads. Um, my uh, random uh, data frame generator is currently just generating uh, co completely at random each of those row, uh, columns independently. You can apply, uh, you can think of a way to, uh, to enforce functional dependencies between the columns to get even more realistic sort of data distributions. So you could say that name is functionally dependent to SN, uh, SSN and then make sure that you always generate 
uh, sort of consistent pairs of the, those uh, those columns. And then you can also implement additional clients, right? So immediately, the, I've already got requests for you know do a Polar's client or do uh, uh, I think Rapid's client as and a couple of other ones that actually some people have reached out to me on Twitter about. But anyway. So that's basically my talk. So, you know, existing benchmarks are not a good fit, uh, fit for data frame systems and fuzzy data can help you in generating and specifying workflows, re, uh, workloads, uh, replaying and scaling them and then enable sort of fuzzy testing of your data frame systems to catch both performance and correctness bugs. Uh, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Great. Thanks for the great talk. So are there any questions in the room currently? Yes, so we have a question in the room. Hi, well, thanks. And uh, that's kind of cool. And maybe we'll make a note for DuckDB. Um, I did notice that your generators, it looked almost exactly like the same set of operations for um, data cleaning, uh, like from Potter's Wheel. Oh, right. Yeah, OK. Um, from Potter's wheel, yeah, I'm I'm trying to recall that uh, that paper because uh, I, I guess I read it a while back. That's that's true. Um, uh, and the the set of operations that I've implemented right now is uh, is fairly limited, but you will see that it is uh, again mostly relational. But add uh, we've got a few. Whoops. Okay, <laughs> we've added a few different uh, sort of set of operations as well. Uh, I, I I don't know if I can further comment on that actually, uh, but I'll definitely look into it. Like uh, because if there's like additional operations that are that could be included in this, that would definitely be you know welcome. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So my question would be: Would this also be useful to uh, execute it on distributed runtimes? So or uh, and when you do like, do you have a problem in in scaling this? Um, that, that's an excellent question. So um, modem will parallelize your uh, sort of data frame execution and it's typically on single single machine, you know, in a shared memory environment. But um, if you write the correct client uh, and if you assume that you've got a shared sort of storage system, I don't see any immediate barriers to say that, you, okay, let's implement um, uh, I, I've, I've, I'm not exactly sure which uh, system you had in mind, which may be distributed for data frames, but you could write a client for that. And assuming, uh, and the abstractions right now that I have for that the client code has to implement, these are, these are defined as abstract base classes in fuzzy data and the implementation is in the client, right? Uh, so if you write the appropriate serialization and deserialization routines, you can still use all of this existing abstraction, and then you can judge how well your distributed client is actually executing these things, right? So I, th I think a lot of these things are still the same. One of the issues I might think of is uh, correctly measuring performance. So um, I would only be able to tell you end-to-end -end query time, right? Like you issued the query and then the client returned an answer. I, I can start the clock then, st stop the clock then, but I won't be able to give you further insight into what happened in the distributed system that is causing that, right? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question about this sampling. So how do you guarantee that you measure the same thing when you sample two different systems? Oh, that's that's an excellent question. And like have yeah. different seeds and different samples and yeah. it's not really comparable, is it? Or? No, it is not. At this stage, it's definitely not comparable. Uh, so right now the regression test for sample is to see if you are returning the same number of rows, but I won't be able to do a row to row comparison to like, I mean, it doesn't really make sense either, right? Like you, you like you sa sample on different uh, systems, you will not get the same sample. So um, that's, a, that's a great question. So for, uh, for any workload that involves that sampling, I won't be able to do. And in, in fact, right now, fuzzy data doesn't really do row to row matches for correctness testing. Correctness testing right now is literally, can the system execute this query correctly or not? And is my expected number of rows this correct? That's all. So. But that's a great extension to it, right? They have to add that. Yeah, 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 sure. So it also depends on which type of sampling you're doing, because if you're doing uniform sampling, it, it is more costly depending on which algorithm you apply, right? To Absolutely. Do that, right? Yeah, again, the, 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 the sampling that I do is completely 
client dependent, right? So pandas has a dot sample, for example. Uh, the current implementation in SQL is literally uh, uh, select uh, with the random limit, whatever the number of rows you want, and that's it, right? So, so that's so again, those details are left to the client implementation, how you want to implement it for different clients. And like I said, we don't we don't do row to row comparisons to verify correctness for these, right? I'm not looking for data correctness at the point, but but it's definitely something that can be explored. Yeah. Awesome. Really, really good questions. Yeah. Okay, great. Then uh, we've I got one more in the room, I think. So, okay. uh, for example, do you have any plans to extend your system to support the Spark Pandas? Yes. So that was another uh, request that I got. And again, yes, that is a distributed version for data frames. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I believe, uh, you, you know, if you look at the GitHub page, there is, you know, these 10 different sort of templates that need to be filled out. You fill out the query templates, you fill out the, the connection adapter, and then it should immediately go to um, so, so I, I, I can do it myself and I invite folks to collaborate on GitHub and just literally write a client for this and you can, you can extend it. So definitely the focus has mostly been on modern because of the feature parity that it uh, advertises with pandas, but definitely want to extend it for more clients. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So we don't have any more questions in the room. Are there questions online? Uh, currently no questions online. So I would propose that we go into the break. Uh, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. Yes. Mm.